Well, it is good to welcome you today. Isn't it good to be together as we're able to open up God's Word? We're in the book of Romans, and I ask you to take your Bibles, and we're going to turn to the third chapter of Romans. Paul addresses four groups of people here in this section, uh, and we've been looking at this over the last few weeks. Uh, A couple weeks ago, we looked at the depraved Gentile society, those who are godless, people who don't care about God, people who um, live a godless life. And we spent some time talking about that, and what was interesting is that there seems to be some similarities of our Western culture as well, as we looked at this passage of Scripture. And then in chapter 2, we looked at the moral people, the the moralists, those who have a conscience, but they don't follow that conscience. Um, And um, they know between right and wrong, but they simply don't do what is right. And some people ask, will they be judged? And Paul painted the picture completely for us, yes, they will be judged. Last week we talked about the self-righteous Jew, a religious person who believes in God, who keeps all of the regulations, and in fact they keep track of those regulations. If you were to ask them how they're doing, they would be able to tell you exactly where they are in the process of following God. However, the problem is it's more head knowledge than it is heart knowledge, and they simply live the way that they want to. And then when we got down to the end of chapter 2 last week, Paul threw a winning touchdown pass. You see, the Eagles weren't the only ones who won last week. Paul won because he threw an incredible pass in verse 29 of chapter 2, and here's what he says. He says, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God, and a true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law, rather... It is a change of heart. And last week, uh, everyone just simply said that with me, a change of heart. It is a change of heart produced by the Spirit, and a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. And that's key as well, because so many times we live life trying to please other people around us, but Paul really nails it down. He says, if you've had a change of heart then you have a change of focus, and that focus is not upon people, but it is upon God. And when you put your focus upon God and allow Him to transform your life in the way that Paul is talking about here, a changed heart, it changes everything. And I'm so thankful for that. Last week, we had a couple situations come up that, uh, that we were able to, to really just put this into practice. We found out about a need in the schools of of some sickness going around, and whether it was Kleenexes that they needed or hand sanitizer. And one of the teachers just uh, sent a message to the church and saying, hey, here's a need that we have. And, and we were able, because of the generosity of some people here at the church, we were able to meet some of that need. It was kind of fun to see some of the pictures posted last week on Facebook of boxes, cases of Kleenexes going into the school. It, it, that's, that's what we're talking about. Because when God changes our heart, a change of focus, it's not upon self, but it's upon the things of the Lord. In fact, last week, I, I just it's always fun to brag on people, but there were two ladies who uh, made a trip to Mexico, Missouri, and um, it was a, a long story, won't go into all of it, but, but just started out with a person in need at McDonald's, and um, she had young kids and um, needed to get back to family. And so we were able to connect those, uh, those needs with some people here at the church, and we were able to drive them back to Mexico, Missouri, so that they could be with family. And someone asked me, they said, are you able to do that for everyone? And I said, no, we're not able to do that for everyone. But all I know is that I want to do for one what we can't do for everyone, but that one, and as we pray and let the Holy Spirit lead us, that one, God is able to change a life. And when Paul speaks about this, produced by the Spirit, a change of heart. All I know is that as we have opportunity, why not make a difference, even if it's one life at a time? And that's what Paul is talking about here. A change of heart, our focus being upon God. Today, we're going to spend one more week talking about God's wrath. This is uh, one more message that is hard to preach because so many times we misunderstand uh, the wrath of God. In fact, I, I just wrote down some notes of what we, um, we need to understand um, about God's wrath. And sometimes we, we misunderstand it. 
And today, I just want to make sure that we completely understand who God is and what the wrath of God is. And so I wrote down five simple things of, of for us to understand God's wrath. And the first one is this. God's wrath is not like our wrath. Too many times we try to compare God's wrath with, with people in our life and we begin to think about people who fly off the handle, who speak without thinking. Well, folks, I want you to know that's not the wrath of God. God does not fly off the handle. We want God to deal with evil, and God deals with evil justly. And that's why we face the wrath of God. That's why all people, but but again, we must understand, it's not like we often think of wrath, but it's because God has a perfect love, pure heart in his life, we're able to really experience all that he has, and we're able to see who he really is. And so God's wrath is not like our wrath. wrath. So don't try to compare it to people here on this earth. God is just. God is fair. And he's fair with us. The second thought is God's wrath is provoked by man's evil actions, by our life. God's love, I want you to understand, is constant. I love to preach about the love of God. God's love for our life is constant. Our heavenly Father loves us unconditionally. He is always there. But just as much as he's always there, his eye is upon us. And as man lives contrary to what God has in store for our life, it provokes his wrath. And again, rightly so, because we want God to be fair. We want God to be just with us. Third truth is this. God is slow to anger. And we need to be thankful for that. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And I'm so thankful for that. Sometimes I get impatient. But I'm so thankful God does not get impatient with us. He constantly is there trying to encourage us. And that's why I think sometimes He is delayed in his coming again because he wants no one to perish. He's delayed in, in really pushing the envelope as far as the wrath toward our lives because he wants us to come into relationship. It's kind of like the father waiting for his lost son to come home. The father continues to watch. And so God is slow as far as wrath is concerned because he wants the best for our life. The fourth truth, God's wrath is already being revealed In the very first message of this series, as we've looked at the book of Romans, we learned in chapter 1, verse 18, that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The wrath of God, you can see it in lives. You can see it in our culture. Um, It is being revealed. In verse 24 and 26 and 28 of chapter 1, It says that God gave them over to their depraved mind. You see, the mind that has become darkened, the hardened heart, God doesn't want that to be a part of our life. In fact, he'll do everything he can to keep that from happening. But the scripture says that he will give us over to that. And that's why it's so important for us to protect our heart, to protect our mind, and to make sure that we put things in our life that point us to the things of God rather than the things of man. And the final thought I want to share with you is this concerning God's wrath. God's wrath is on all sinners. And I pause for a moment because let that sink in. It's on all of us. John chapter 3, verse 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And I say praise the Lord to that. But... John also goes on to write, he says, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And again, as we look at our life, as we think about following all that God has in store for us, it's important for us to understand That if we don't follow the ways of God, if we don't choose Jesus Christ to make up the difference in our life, to accept His great grace, then the reality is we will face God's wrath. And if we don't have Jesus 
to face God's wrath, standing with Him, you're going to face it all alone, and it's not going to be good. You see, the love of God, I love to preach about God's love. It, it's popular. I love to talk about heaven, how heaven can be our home. But just as much as a person preaches about heaven, talks about the love of God, and again, I think we need to talk about that more and more and more because I don't think we fully comprehend the great love the Father has for me, the great love that God has for you. You are His child. He has chosen each one of us. God's love. But for us to really understand God's love, and as your pastor, I need to be faithful in making sure that we understand what hell is going to be like. God's wrath, that's the ultimate expression of God's wrath. It's not so much, it's not a popular topic, and especially on a Sunday morning to talk about the hell, to talk about God's wrath, to talk about sin. I shared a poll a couple weeks ago with you, it was a couple years ago uh, that this poll was taken, and uh, those who said they believe in God, 79%. 64% said they believe in hell. But when they asked if they believed that if they were going to go there, only 1% said they thought they would actually go to hell. You see, I fear that maybe we have lost the passion and the reality that if people do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're not going to make heaven their home. I want to talk about heaven. I want to teach about it. I want you to understand how good heaven is to be with those who have gone on before us, to be with our Father, to be with Jesus, the one who's made all of this possible. So incredible for us to think about. But the reality is, and I want to be very clear with us today, that if we don't know Jesus, heaven is not going to be our, our home for all of eternity. And that's why it's so important. We've taken some time to really talk about God's wrath. This is the fourth message I've preached on it. And the reason is because in chapters 1, 2, and and here in chapter 3 in Romans, Paul lays it out for us. He wants us to be clear, to fully understand, to grasp. If we don't know Jesus, then we're going to face God's wrath alone. We need to understand before we can accept God's gracious gift of His grace, we need to understand just how lost we are. Martin Luther said that people must understand their lostness before they can be saved. And family today, whether it's for your own life or maybe someone in your family or those that you're praying for, my prayer is this, that God would stir in us a passion, a desire so much to love people into the kingdom of God. That's what God has called the church to do. and That's what's a part of who we are here at Carthage Nazarene, to love people into the kingdom. But in order to truly love them, then we've got to understand, especially for our own life, really how lost people are without Christ. That motivates us to share the love of Christ. Well, Paul, here in chapter 3, he um, addresses all of us, the entire human race. It's almost as if he draws a line in his writing here in verses 1 through 8. Paul knew his audience. They're much like we are today. The people that he was writing to, they seem to try to run spiritual truths through the filter of human understanding. And we get into trouble when we do that as well. But Paul simply says, stop, that won't work. Don't try to justify your actions or your thoughts. It will not work. You can't try to bring it into how we live our life here. He says, let's draw a line and let's let's really understand the reality of God's judgment, God's wrath, so that we can fully understand God's grace and God's love and God's purpose, God's life for each one of us. And so in verse 9, and this is where we're going to pick up in our text today, Paul makes it clear that that all of us are going to face, because we are under the power of sin, all of us are going to face God's wrath. But what is beautiful, he brings it down to the point where we get to face it with Christ 
But if we don't have Christ in our life, then we will have hell to pay. And so in verse 9, he says this, Well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? And remember, we've already addressed some of this before, the religious people. But Paul says, no, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, and I pause for a moment to talk about all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, he says, are under the power of sin. Nine times Paul mentions the universality of sin here, uh, of all people. He's saying God is not going to show favoritism. It's going to be for all people across the board. He says all people have sinned and fall short of God's glory. We must understand that. Because sometimes if we're not careful, we begin to put ourselves, maybe not on a pedestal, but we begin to think of ourselves a little higher than maybe what we should. And maybe it's because of the family that we were raised in or because of our spiritual heritage or maybe just the culture that we live in. And we begin to say, well, hey, all's okay, I'm good. And especially when we compare ourselves to others, we look at our life and we say, I'm good to go. But what Paul is making clear here in the Scripture, he says, no, he says, all people, all of us fall short. And Paul makes the argument here. He says, for we have already shown that all people, let's unpack the word shown. If we go back to the original language, that word shown is literally a a legal term. It would be found in a legal context. For example, a court of law. And um, what Paul is saying, it has been shown, the charge has been made against you. Like the indictment uh, of, of, of charges that are pleaded against you. Um, And we'll talk about those charges in just a few moments. But when I began to understand this, I thought, man, think of of the gravity of of what this would be like to really listen to the charges being read against you. I went back to maybe some um, shows like Law and Order, and when they're standing in the courtroom and they're reading the charges against someone, when you're watching from the outside looking in, it doesn't seem so bad, but just put yourself in the place of the one who is being convicted. And when the charges would be read against you, the gravity of what those charges would be like. Early in my ministry, I uh, moved to a new church, and it was uh, um, not long after I'd been there that a family came to me and said, there's a person in our church that... Is, uh, has charges against her, and, and they asked if I would be a pastor and, and would go and, and uh, help support. And so I still remember that day. I went into the courtroom, and it was a packed courtroom, and they had a seat saved for me, and it was directly behind uh, the lady who the charges were filed against. And I remember sitting there directly behind her, and I remember listening to the prosecutor reading the charges that were charged against her. First, I said, Lord, thank you that I'm not sitting in that chair. But as I was sitting directly behind her, the gravity of the situation overwhelmed me. And that's what Paul is really painting a picture for us. In verses 18 through, or 10 through 18, Paul lists out 13 charges against all people. It's sobering when you realize that these charges that he's talking about are against you. They're against me. And Paul, he pulls from the Old Testament scriptures. I won't take time to read the Old Testament passages uh, for you today. You probably have notes in the margins. But Paul, he reads these charges. He, He explains these charges for the people. And he divides these charges into three categories. And, um, and let me just give these three to you, uh, just briefly. He, he divides them into our character, into our conversation, and into our conduct. And as we look at verses 10 through, through 18, you'll see how he divides these up. And so Paul literally writes, mankind is guilty in regard to their character. And verse 10 says, as the scriptures say, No one is righteous, not even one. And I just want to say to Paul, you mean no one? And Paul would look back at us and say, no one. 
And then what we do in our human process, and again, as we try to run it through the filter of, of how we begin to think about things, we, we begin to look at people's lives and we say, well, you mean no one? I mean, even like my Aunt Nell, who was the greatest person ever, and Paul would say, no, not even your Aunt Nell. My Aunt Nell, man, she could make the best pies. She was a great cook. She was a great lady. Now, she did have one fault. She liked to drive fast. She had a 1970 Chevy Chevelle, and that thing would fly down the road. Now, now if she got pulled over, she'd kind of throw the grandma trump card type thing. You know, here's a little old lady sitting in this car, and she'd say, Officer, what was I doing wrong? And the officer would look at her and would always let her off the hook. But besides that, she was a great person. Everything was perfect. And yet, when Paul writes these words, you'd say, even my Aunt Nell, you mean she is not right, righteous? And Paul would say, not even your aunt. And so we can't look around and try to compare ourselves because Paul makes it clear, not even her. Verse 11, no one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. You see, apart from divine grace, there is no one who understands. No one who seeks God. You see, it's God who draws us to Him. God is seeking us. And Paul makes it so, so very clear here. There is no one truly wise. In another letter that Paul writes, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, he, he kind of paints the same picture. He's saying that they are darkened in their understanding. They're separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. The ignorance. Now, I don't want to make you feel bad, but we don't have an understanding. We are ignorant. And the reason that we're ignorant toward the things of God is because of the hardening of our heart. We've already talked about how God has made His perfect will known to us. I mean, all of creation draws us to the things of God, but because we'd rather put ourselves in first place and serve ourselves rather than God because we allow our hearts to be hardened, Paul says we have become ignorant. Here in, here in Romans, he says we're not wise. Verse 12, all have sinned. All have turned away. All have become useless. You know what I hate? I hate when I get a bowl out at the house and I take a box of cereal and I pour into the, the, the bowl and then I take a banana. This is kind of my morning ritual. And I'll slice up the banana and put it on my cereal. But when I go to the fridge and I pull out the milk, what I hate is when that milk, you, you take off the lid and you smell to see if it's any good and if it's just a little bit spoiled, you think, okay, can I handle it or not? But when it's really spoiled, I hate when I find that. It's happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you. And so you have to like, play the game in your mind. I mean, am I going to go ahead and eat this cereal or am I not? And oftentimes you can't because the milk is spoiled. When we look at this word here, useless, that's what Paul is talking about. The only thing you can do with that milk is to pour it down the drain. And Paul is saying here, he says, all have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. You can't buy your way, earn your way, do enough good. Paul makes it clear, because all of our goodness falls short. And the only thing in and of ourselves that we're really good for is to be poured down the drain useless like spoiled milk. All have sinned. No one does good. Not a single one. So when you look at our character, there's a, the, the picture is bleak in and of ourself. The second area that Paul begins to list the charges against us, that mankind is guilty, is in the area of conversation. Verse 13, Paul writes this, Their talk is foul. Like the stench from an open grave. And Paul, he's going back to Jesus' teaching 
in Matthew chapter 12 where Jesus warned his disciples that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so when Paul begins to list the charges against them, he really helps them understand that as the words we speak is really the overflow of who we are on the inside. And when we look at the words here that the stench from an open grave, you literally begin to understand the inner corruption of people's lives and what comes out and the lethal effects of their speech. Have you ever said something and then you like pause and you say, where did that come from? How did I even think to say that? I didn't mean to speak those words. And what Paul really helps us understand is that out of the heart, our words come. Their tongues, Paul writes, are filled with lies. Deceitful tongues use flattery with evil intent. Deceitful lies. We talked about that a couple weeks ago in chapter 1, verse 29. We talked about the gossipers. Oftentimes we want to point toward the the sins that we're comfortable with pointing fingers at. But Paul says all sin is sin, even the gossipers. And here, once again, he helps us understand that our conversation, he goes on to write, he says, snake venom drips from their lips. I think about the venom. I think about the poison that can come from the words that we speak that inflict injury and destruction on others. You know, we either can build people up with the words we speak or we tear people down. There's power in words. And Paul says, it is held against us. The charges are against us. Verse 14 says, their mouths are full of cursing and full of bitterness. When I read those words, I thought about times when I've been in a group of people or I've been with family members and especially if there's some Arguments that are taking place and bitterness and raging takes place. Maybe some bickering, some fighting. And oftentimes people begin to use words that they shouldn't be using and they'll just tell a person off. And I thought about the chaos that that creates within families. And what Paul is getting at here is that it must not be. And yet it happens more times than not. I think about families that are destroyed, marriages that are hurt, friendships that are broken because of the wrong words that are used. People speaking without thinking. And what Paul is saying here, God's wrath in our character, in our conversation, we we begin to understand who we are as people. And then the final area that Paul looks at here is verse 15 he says we're guilty in regard to our conduct verse 15 says they rush to commit murder oftentimes we want to look back in history and say well yes they were i mean old testament times they were quick to to murder to go after their enemy but family we need to bring it down to where we live today Because even within the lifetime of many people who are still here, they have seen the atrocities take place. And we begin to really understand just how evil man is. We can talk about Nazi. We can talk about Germany. We can talk about the 11 million Jews who were killed. That is within our generation here. That took place. We can talk about the Cambodian Cambodian genocide. We can talk about Rwanda. We can talk about the Bosnian genocide. We see evil in man. I mean, even here in America, when we talk about the abortions that have taken place, you can't help but to see how evil man is. And that's why Paul, as he's listing out these charges, he helps us understand without God, we are desperate. Without God in our life, evil sin resides verse 16 he says destruction misery always follow them they don't know where to find peace paul uses the plural pronoun here he's talking about a nation's lifestyle of sinful corruption that corruption that keeps a society from experiencing peace and it doesn't take long whether you watch the news 
or you get on Facebook, or even some of the news that's surrounding the Olympics that are taking place as we speak, there's some countries that are at odds. There's not much peace. And when we bring it down to right here, even in our culture, people, they lack peace in their life. And Paul says it's because destruction, misery, always follow them. We begin to see just how bad we are. And it's important for us to understand that. Verse 18 says they have no fear of God at all. No fear of God. And I thought, man, I'm thankful that's not me. And yet when I began to unpack this, I've thought of times when I probably haven't really understood and appreciated the fear of God. I want to unpack this for just a moment and then we'll wrap things up. But the fear of God, we need to understand, is a respect for God's greatness, for His glory, for His majesty. I've heard people question God. And again, it's okay to go to God with your questions. He wants us to be real. He has His arms ready to to draw us close. But when people really begin to question God in in a way that um, is, is, is demeaning who God is. I mean, maybe questioning God for situations that take place like a tragedy, like a tornado or loss of a young child, or we could just make a long list of things that people don't understand. And in our human understanding, we don't understand. But when we begin to blame God, then we're losing the respect of who God is, His majesty, His glory. His greatness. And too many times when we fall prey to that that trap, we, we in essence are rejecting who God is and we no longer respect Him. The wrath of God will be upon us. The fear of God, we need to understand, is a desire to worship Him. 1 John 1, 3 says, Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. Our life we live, it's about Jesus. But we tend to make it so much more about other things than Jesus. And I'm talking more than just the music that we sing or the translation of the Bible that we use. Too many times we try to make our worship about us rather than about Him. And it's because we have lost our reverence, our fear of who God is. The fear of God, it's a consciousness that God is the judge of all the earth. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 says, The Lord will judge His own people. And rightly so. He is going to judge us for who we are. He's going to look into our life. He's going to look at our conduct. He's going to look at our conversation. He's going to look at our character. And he is going to judge us. And Paul makes it clear. (laughs) This is one of those messages that is a little bit sobering. We probably aren't going to walk out of the church today or get up from the computer today and give one another high fives and say, Oh, good, I feel good today. Paul doesn't. That's not what this passage is about. We need to understand the gravity of our sin, of who we are apart from Christ. In verse 19, he says this, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. We are held accountable. He says, therefore, verse 20, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. We can't earn our way. Rather, he says, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. That's important. And that's what Paul has tried to begin to help us understand. The need in our life. The sin in our life. The gravity of 
of who we are apart from Christ, we are nothing. And heaven will not be our home. And we will have hell, the price to pay for all of eternity. And Paul, man, he has painted a bleak picture. And we need to understand that picture. Not in a way to point fingers, but in a way for us to look into our own life. And so, I can't wait to get to next week and the next few chapters because we really begin to understand that just as dark as life is without Christ, we begin to understand how beautiful it is when we allow Christ to come into our life. But for today, we need to understand the gravity of where we really do stand. Oh, it's been a while back, and I uh, was sharing Jesus with a friend. I built a relationship with him, and, and uh, um, I was just, uh, just it, sometimes... Um, as the conversation goes a little deeper, and they know I'm a pastor, and so they kind of know where I'm headed oftentimes with a conversation, especially as it gets turned towards some spiritual things. And, and, um, and so I started down that path, and this friend said to me, he said, Dustin, hey, it's okay. I, I'm good. I, I, we don't need to talk about this. And, and, and I respect people. I, I, I never want to push my way in. And I said, well, I'm glad you're good. That's great. And, and so we just changed the subject and went on to something else. Well, well just a few moments later, my friend kind of looked back at to me, and he simply said, I think I'm good. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, what we were talking about earlier. He said, I, I think I'm okay. He said, I'm a good person. I, I, think, I think it's all good. And so I just began to help him understand and unpack and of what that goodness looks like. And, and I reminded him that in order to make heaven our home, that we have to be perfect. And I probably had some fun talking about, are you a perfect person? And, and he didn't answer me right then. And I'm glad he didn't ask me if I was perfect because um, none of us are perfect, are we? And yet the scripture says in Matthew 5.48 that we are called to be perfect just as our heavenly Father is perfect. And I helped him understand that in order to make heaven our home, in order to see the Lord, that we've got to live holy lives. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about that. We have to be holy. And so I, I literally took him to a piece of paper, and probably a napkin as we were having lunch together, and I just wrote out some numbers, and I've put it here on the board today. And I said, let's just, let's just pretend or let this be kind of the, the grade, the scale that we're going to place ourselves on. I said, where would you place yourself? And he kind of knew where I was headed, so he, he was really guarded. He was careful not to say where he was. But, but he had said to me, he said, you know, I was good. I, I'm good. I'm good to go. And so I, I kind of had some fun with him. I said, would you place yourself at a seven, eight, nine, you know, to, to be wherever that may be. I said, now I want to remind you that, that th th let's say this is, this is where God is. He is holy, holy God right here. In order to make heaven our home, we have to be a ten. And so we had some fun talking about that. And I talked about where one might be, you know, talking about Hitler or Stalin or maybe the most evil people that we could think of. And I said, where would you place yourself on that scale? And so we talked about that for just a moment. And I said, before you, before you answer it, I, I want us to talk about some other good people that, uh, that we are at least familiar with. And so I said, who's the most holy person, godly person that you can think of? And he said, well... Maybe uh, Mother Teresa. And I said, you know, I, I would agree with you. I've read quite a bit of writings of Mother Teresa. I've even read some articles that, that people interviewed Mother Teresa. And I said, you know where Mother Teresa placed herself? He said, where? And I said, she placed herself probably a four or a five. And so I wrote down Mother Teresa here. And, uh, And he kind of looked at me, and he knew where I was headed. I said, what about Billy Graham? I said, where would you place Billy Graham? He said, well, I don't think I'd place him above Mother Teresa. And I said, well, Billy Graham didn't place himself there either. But Billy Graham, he literally, in his books that he's written, he has said, would you pray for me? I want to be more like Jesus. I fall short. I need you to pray for me. And so Billy Graham literally places himself here. 
I said, where would you place me? And he looked at me and he was like, oh, I'm not going to judge you. And I said, thank you. I said, but I know for sure I'm not going to place myself above Mother Teresa or Billy Graham. And so I just wrote my name here. And I said, so where would you place yourself? He kind of hung his head and he said, well, I don't think I maybe get into the scripture and go to church as often as you go. And he said, I'd have to be below you. And I said, well, I don't know where you stand, but all I know is where I stand. All I know is the testimony of Billy Graham and Mother Teresa, where they would place themselves. I said, but the reality is, the scripture says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And I said, you see, there's quite a gap between where we place ourselves and where we are. There's quite a gap in order to make heaven our home. And I said, you can either try to face eternity on your own, or you can choose Jesus Christ. And I said, I want you to understand and really have this picture in your mind. You see, there's, there's so much gap here between who we are and how we're to live our life, holiness, to see Jesus. And I said to this friend, I said, in order to make heaven your home, you have to be perfect. He said, well, I'm lost. He said, I'll never get there. And I said, man, that's right. Neither will I. In myself, I cannot earn my way. I cannot be holy enough. But I said, I want you to understand, and this is the message of the cross, the message of God's perfect love for us. I want you to understand what Jesus did for each one of us. Jesus literally came to this earth to make man right with God to stand in the gap, to allow His righteousness, His holiness. You see, He lived a perfect life without sin. And when He hung up on the cross, when He conquered death, our sins were forgiven. And here's the beauty. No matter where you are on the scale, you're never going to make heaven your home in and of yourself. But if you would choose Jesus Christ and allow Christ to make the difference, to fill in the gap between where we are and God's holy standard for heaven, if you'll choose Jesus, and when you face the wrath of God, you won't face it alone, but you're going to face it with the goodness of who Christ is. And I said to my friend, in order to make heaven your home, you have to choose Christ. You have to allow Him to make the difference in your life. You see, Jesus puts us in right standing with God. For it is by grace that you have been saved, Paul writes. This is not from yourself. It's faith. It's the gift of God that we're able to be saved. And if you would trust Jesus Christ and put your life in Him and accept Him and His forgiveness for your life and you would serve Him, then when you face on Judgment Day... You stand before God, it's not your righteousness, but it's the righteousness of Christ that will let you see God and to make heaven your home. And when he answered the question of, you know, are you good to go? He began to understand, well, not in, my, in myself, but if I would allow Christ to be the Lord of my life. And then I'd be good to go. And I said, you're right. You would be good to go. And today, I would ask each one of you, where would you rate yourself? A scale of 10 being high, 1 being low? Would, where would you place yourself? You'd probably have to join the rest of us as saying things don't look too good in and of myself. I've had some evil thoughts. I've said the wrong word. My character has not always been flawless. I fall short. And that's the reality. And Paul's given some great charges against us. The gravity is upon us. But good news. We'll unpack more of this in the weeks to come. But the good news is this. Christ makes up the difference. My prayer is this, that none of us would go home today or log offline today without really understanding, without God, we are lost. God's wrath, we will face it and you will face it alone. 
But if you'll place your life in Jesus Christ, allow Christ to make the difference when you face God. You'll be able to stand with Jesus and say, because of his righteousness, because of his holiness, because I have chosen Jesus Christ, I can stand before God with a clear heart and a clear conscience, knowing that Jesus, my life is found in him. And so as we wrap things up today, would you just rate yourself, be real with yourself, And then would you begin to understand that the righteousness of Christ will make up the difference. And it's your choice, my choice. Are we going to choose him? And my prayer is this, that yes, you would choose him. I've asked for us to close uh, for the next two or three minutes. Just a moment of just reflection saying, Christ, just as I am, I'm going to come before you to allow your forgiveness to come into my life. I'm going to choose you. And I ask you as you're sitting there at the computer or watching on your phone that you would not let this day go by without knowing beyond any doubt that your life is found in Christ and that you're going to serve Him and follow Him all the days of your life so that when we face judgment, when we face the wrath of God, You won't face it alone, but you'll face it with the righteousness of Christ. So I'll pray with us in just a few moments, but John's going to sing, and I just ask that you'd have a moment with God today. So let's bow before.